The Trumpet of the Swan, Chapter 18, Freedom. The news of Serena's arrival on Bird Lake had finally reached the head man in charge of birds. He went out to look at her and was delighted. Then he gave an order to one of his keepers. See to it that she is pinioned this morning, right away, before she flies off and leaves us. That swan is a valuable bird. Make sure she doesn't get away. Lewis was just waking from his nap when he saw two keepers approaching Serena, who was standing on the shore near the ornamental fence. One keeper carried a large net with a long handle. The other carried surgical instruments. They were sneaking up on Serena from behind, very slowly and quietly. Lewis knew right away what they were up to. He grew hot with rage. If those men succeeded in catching Serena and cutting a wingtip, all his plans would go wrong. She could never fly away. To the lonely lake with him, she would have to remain in Philadelphia the rest of her life. A horrible fate. This is my moment, thought Lewis. Nobody is going to clip my love's wings while I'm around. He hustled over to the island and stripped for action. He chucked his trumpet and all his other stuff under a willow tree. Then he returned to the water and waited for the right time to attack. The keeper holding the net was crawling quietly up on the ground to Serena from the rear. She did not notice him. She was just standing there dreaming of Lewis. Slowly, slowly, the keeper raised his net. And as he did so, Lewis went into action, lowering his long, powerful neck until it pointed straight out in front of him like a lance. He streaked across the water, straight at the keeper, his wings beating at the air, his feet beating at the water. And in a flash, he reached the scene and drove his strong bill right into the seat of the man's pants. It was a well-aimed jab. The keeper doubled over in pain and dropped the net. The other keeper tried to grab Serena by her throat. Lewis beat him over the head with his wings, striking terrific blows and knocking the poor fellow off his feet. Surgical instruments bounced into the air. The net fell into the water. One keeper groaned and held his hand on his behind where he had been stabbed. The other keeper lay on the ground, almost knocked out. Serena slipped quickly into the water and glided gracefully away. Lewis followed. He motioned for her to stay on the lake. Then he raced back to the island, grabbed his trumpet, his slate, his chalk pencil, his medal, and his money bag, flew over the balustrade, and walked boldly on into the birdhouse. He was still mad. He went straight to the office of the head man in charge of birds, and he rapped on the door. Come in, said a voice. Lewis entered. The head man was seated at his desk. Hello, Lewis, he said. Woohoo, replied Lewis through his trumpet. What's on your mind? asked the man. Well, Lewis placed his trumpet on the floor and took his slate and chalk pencil from his neck. I'm in love, he wrote. The head man leaned back in his chair and put his hands behind his head. His face had a faraway look. He gazed out of the window for a moment in silence. Well, he said, it's natural that you're in love. You're young, you're talented. In a couple of months, spring will be here. All birds fall in love in the springtime. I suppose you're in love with one of my young swans. Serena, wrote Lewis on the chalkboard. She arrived the day before yesterday. I used to know her slightly. Back in Montana, he wrote. She loves me, too. Oh, well, that doesn't surprise me, said the head man. You're a very unusual young cob. Why, any young female swan would fall for you. You're a great trumpeter, one of the best. I'm delighted to hear about this love affair, Lewis. You and your bride can stay right here on Bird Lake. Raise your family in comfort and safety in the oldest zoo in the United States. Lewis shook his head in disagreement. I have other plans, he wrote. Then he set his slate down and raised his trumpet. They say that falling in love is wonderful. Well, it was an old song by Irvin Berlin, and the room was filled with the sound of love. The head man had a dreamy look in his eyes. Lewis set his horn down and took up his slate again. I'm taking Serena away with me in a day or two, he wrote. Oh, no, you're not, said the head man firmly. Serena belongs to the zoo. She is the property of the people of Philadelphia. She came here because of an act of God. 
It wasn't an act of God, wrote Lewis. It was high winds. Well, anyway, said the head man, she's my swan now. No, she's mine, wrote Lewis. She's mine by reason of the power of love, the greatest force on earth. Well, the head man became thoughtful. Well, you can't take Serena from the zoo anyway. She will never fly again. My keepers clipped one of her wings only a few minutes ago. They tried to, wrote Lewis on his slate, but I beat them up. The head man looked surprised. Was it a fair fight? It was a fair fight, wrote Lewis. They were sneaking up on her from behind, so I sneaked up on them from behind. They hardly knew what hit them, he wrote. The head man chuckled. I wish I'd seen it, he said. But look here, Lewis, you've got to realize the position I'm in. I have a duty to the people of Philadelphia. Within the last couple of months, I've acquired two rare birds by accident, you and Serena, two trumpeter swans. One arrived here blown by a gale, the other to keep a nightclub engagement. The whole business is most unusual for my zoo. I have my responsibility to the public. It is my duty as head man in charge of birds to see that Serena stays. You yourself, of course, are free to leave when you want to because Mr. Lucas insisted that you remain free when we arrange for your Sunday concerts. But in Serena's case, well, Lewis, she's got to have her left wing tip amputated. The zoo can't afford to lose a young, beautiful, valuable trumpeter swan just because you happen to be in love. Besides, I think you're making a great mistake. If you and Serena stay here, you'll be safe. You'll have no enemies. You'll have no worries about your children. No fox, no otter, no coyote will ever attack you with intent to kill. You'll never go hungry. You'll never get shot. You'll never die of lead poisoning from eating the shotgun pellets that are on the bottom of all natural lakes and ponds. Your cygnets will be hatched each spring and will live long life in perfect ease and comfort. What more can a young cub ask for? Freedom, replied Lewis on his slate in all capital letters. Safety is all well and good. I prefer freedom. With that, Lewis picked up his trumpet and his slate. The headman smiled. He knew just what Lewis meant. For a while, the two remained silent. Lewis put his trumpet aside, then he wrote again. I ask two favors. First, put off the operation on Serena until after Christmas. I guarantee you she won't try to escape. Second, let me send a telegram. Okay, Lewis replied the head man, and he handed Lewis a sheet of paper and a pencil. Lewis wrote out a telegram to Sam Beaver. It said, I am in the Philadelphia Zoo. This is an emergency. Come at once. I will pay for your plane fare. Am now wealthy. Signed, Lewis. He handed the telegram to the head man along with four dollars from his money bag. The head man was astounded. In all his days at the zoo, this was the first time one of his birds had ever asked him to send a telegram. And of course, he didn't know who Sam Beaver was, but he sent the wire and ordered his keepers to let Serena alone for a few more days, which they were glad to do. Lewis thanked him and left. He returned to Serena and they spent the day happily together, bathing, swimming, eating, drinking, and showing each other in a thousand small ways how much they loved each other. Well, Sam arrived at the zoo on the day after Christmas. He was equipped as though he were going into the woods. Under one arm was a sleeping bag, neatly rolled. On his back was a rucksack containing his toothbrush, his comb, a clean shirt, a hand axe, a pocket compass, his notebook, a pencil, and some food. In his belt was a hunting knife. Sam was 14 now and big for his age. Well, he had never seen a large zoo. He and Lewis were overjoyed to see each other again. Lewis introduced Sam to Serena. Then he opened his money bag and showed Sam all his earnings. $100 bills, $50 bills, $20 bills, $10 bills, fives, ones, and even some silver coins, a great pile. Goodness, said Sam. I hope she's not marrying him for his money. Well, Lewis took his slate and told Sam about the fight with the keepers and how the head man wanted to keep Serena captive by clipping one tip of her wing. He told Sam it would ruin his life if Serena were to lose the power to fly. He explained that as soon as his father's debts were paid and the trumpet honestly belonged to him, 
He and Serena intended to leave civilization and return to a wild life. The sky, he wrote on his slate, is my living room. The woods are my parlor. The lonely lake is my bath. I can't remain behind a fence all my life. Neither can Serena. She is not built that way. Somehow or other, we must persuade the head man to let Serena go. Sam stretched out on the shore of Bird Lake and clasped his hands behind his head. He looked up at the great wide sky. It was a clear blue with small white clouds floating slowly across. Sam knew how Lewis felt about freedom. For a long time he lay there, thinking. Ducks and geese swam slowly by, back and forth. An endless procession of captive birds. They seemed happy and well. Curiosity, felicity, and apathy, the three trumpeters swam by and peered at the strange boy lying on the ground. Finally, Sam sat up. Listen, Lewis, he said, how's this for an idea? You and Serena intend to raise a family every year, don't you? Certainly, replied Lewis on his slate. Okay, said Sam. In every family of signets, there's always one that needs special care and protection. Bird Lake would be a perfect place for this one little swan that needs extra security. This is a beautiful lake, Lewis. This is a great zoo. If I can persuade the head man to let Serena remain free, would you be willing to donate one of your signets now and then if the zoo needs another swan for the lake? If you agree, I'll go right in and see the head man about the matter. Well, it was now Lewis's turn to think and think. After five minutes, he picked up his slate. Very well, he wrote, it's a deal. Lewis picked up his trumpet and played O in the Evergreening Spring. Oh, ever in the greening spring he had played by bank and bow retiring. Well, the waterfowl stopped swimming and listened. The keepers stopped what they were doing and listened. Sam listened too. The head man in his office in the birdhouse laid down his pencil, leaned back in his chair, and he listened. The sound of Lewis's horn was in the air, and the whole world seemed better and brighter, and wilder and freer, and happier and dreamier. That's a good tune, said Sam. What is it? Oh, just something I made up all by myself, wrote Lewis on his slate. 